Welcome and thank you for uh, joining us in this breakout session. Um, the behavior-based prior learning assessments, transitioning to a virtual experience for online higher education. We have two chat options, one on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for the speakers, we would like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. If you are asking a question to the speaker, we would appreciate if you would use the question mark at the beginning of the question. That helps us know the difference between a comment and a question so we can scroll through easily and identify those questions. So now I'd like to hand off uh, to our moderator for this session, Nick White, and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Hi, I'm Nick White. I'll be the moderator of this esteemed panel. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. I'm the Chief Learning Officer of Alternative Learning at Strategic Education. My background is that I led the competency-based education program design and the digital badge initiatives at Capella University, and I currently lead the academic and program design functions for Alternative Learning, which is a group of non-degree programs offered by Strategic Education. I'm going to be introducing the rest of our panelists, and then we will have a short set of slides and then it will be a panel discussion from there on out and your questions along the way are very welcome. So first I would like to introduce Dr. Tiffany Fries. She serves as the Chief Assessment Officer of the Quilts Institute and as a Senior Consultant with the Competency-Based Education Network. She has extensive experience building competency-based education programs in higher education and work-based settings. She's an experienced and credentialed leader of in-person assessment centers, which we'll be talking about today, and virtually delivered behavior-based assessment using the latest technologies. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kathleen Stone, who is the Associate Vice Provost of Academic Quality at Strayer University. Kathleen's career is focused on innovative approaches to education, including MOOCs, adaptive learning, open educational resources, accessibility, and using competency-based education to reimagine general education to integrate employability skills. Most recently, she has led a team focused on measuring learning and developing innovative approaches to prior learning assessment. And last but not least, I'm happy to introduce Bruce Griffiths, who has 40 years of experience in leadership and consulting. A graduate of the Coast Guard Academy, Bruce served with the Coast Guard and the Navy. He earned a MS in IO psychology and worked for a Fortune 150 company. When he formed OSI, his company in 1980, he has since then consulted with more than 200 organizations, including Disney, Nike, and Siemens. He's on the faculty of UC San Diego and is a leading expert on competency modeling. And he's the recent co-author of both Competencies at Work and Redefining Competency-Based Education from the Business Expert Press. That concludes our introductions. So we're going to go into the presentation. Bruce is going to give us a little bit of background on this concept of assessment centers. Bruce? Yep, thanks very much, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from La Jolla, California. I'm just gonna talk about a couple of fundamentals, um, basics for the programs that we'll be talking about shifting to a virtual environment. So two questions uh, that these programs asked to begin with were what skill sets do employers want? What will we measure? And then how can we reliably measure them? So we've talked a little bit about uh, the, the assessment center already. So I'm one of my uh, passions over time has been this notion of now competency modeling and where, um, where these skill sets come from. And of course, the place to ask is employers, and there's been 50 plus years of research. So if you're, if you're in talent management, human resources, learning and development, or you're in staffing or recruiting, you have been interested in what skill sets you will look for to hire, promote, uh, success and manage for. So it turns out that when you cross these threads, there's a, there's a subset of about six categories that you can probably guess. Communication skills are universal. Um, problem solving, decision-making, good judgment, 
time management, multitasking, um, being efficient, uh, the emotional intelligence skills of relationship building, sensitivity, empathy, and then skills and influence, persuasiveness, the skillful use of power. So once again, these are a consistent set of, uh, you know, the current best practices to call them competencies. They have been called variables or dimensions over time. And they have, they have persisted. So while inflection of the competencies has changed over time, sometimes these basic skill sets have persisted. We just finished some research about remote leadership and would, they, would a remote leader need different competencies or different inflections? And yes, they needed different inflections. So given the skill sets, how would you reliably measure them? So I'm going to represent a, a technique from industrial organizational psychology that was actually kind of invented by AT&T about 60 years ago called the Assessment Center. And it allows, it has allowed mostly private organizations, more recently universities, to measure what have been called soft skills. So it's a rigorous process that involves um, uh, at least three trained evaluators taking a look at probably six participants and the, and the participants experience a day in the life of a professional in an organization. So the experience emulates what it would be like if I was dropped into a company, an organization, could be private or public, and I experience group discussions, role plays, a multitasking exercise, I probably have to give a speech or two, and um, my performance, my behavior is measured against a, a standard of performance across the competencies I just measured, mentioned, right? So it's been around for a while and it produces ratings. So grad students love to do research on assessment centers. And so there's been a ton of research to validate its, its, its effect, efficacy and its reliability too. So, and just FYI, there's a set of professional standards I'm, I belong to a society of industrial organizational psychologists and a subset of us have pro uh, published a set of standards around running an ethical assessment center. So the next slide shows my experience with lots of organizations in validating the model and using this process in, in, private, in the private sector. And so skill sets start with a reverse engineering of somebody who's a high performer, say it's at the Disney organization or at Nike. And what is a high performer? So someone who has produced results, someone who is respected, they have a personal brand that's respected in the company or the organization. They have emotional intelligence, they're likable. And then finally, they're passionate about what they're doing. So if you, I'm not gonna go into the research, but it's rigorous research on, if you take a look at that individual and the outcomes then reverse engineer to what competencies they need, you find these skill sets. So, uh, um, my, probably 90% of my experience has been delivering these live for organizations. And so we'll talk now about the, the transition to online. Thank, thanks so much, Nick. Over to you, Tiffany. All right, I have to say, Bruce, you got a call out in the chat, chat for the Dunder Mifflin on your <laughs> previous slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's the opposite. Do not emulate Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, Welcome. Uh, uh, so I will just build on what Bruce said. I've actually received a lot of training from Bruce. So hopefully I speak well uh, to behavioral assessment methodology today. Um, a little bit different than assessment center methodology. Like Bruce said, there's a specific set of standards associated with assessment center methodology, but all of the assessment we run in our programs are anchored in the behavioral sciences, right? So um, when we talk about behavioral assessment, we're really speaking to what Bruce is saying as well as far as what skills do employers want and how do you measure them? So we will help institutions, um, organizations identify those competency sets for their specific field or industry, um, a specific workplace role, even if it's things like Bruce was speaking to, like communication or professionalism and ethics. Oftentimes, though, when we work with programs uh, identifying those types of competencies, we will uh, contextualize those into that workplace role or that field, for example. Um, but everything we do is anchored in the behavioral sciences, so we're talking about performance. And when we're talking about performance, we really are talking about behavior, something a person does that can be observed, measured, repeated. So it'd be the definition of a behavior. And then to define that behavior accurately, right, and reliably measure it, it has to be defined in behavioral or observable terms, which makes the occurrence of behavior readily apparent to an observer. So when you're talking about behavioral assessment, it's all really anchored in direct observation. 
right? If you're asking somebody to perform, you're saying we need to operationally define it first so that it can be observed. If a behavior can be observed, then you can measure it. If you can measure it, you can improve it. So really all of the assessment um, techniques we use, the assessment types, our assessment methodology is anchored in operational definitions, observation of behavior, which makes it then measurable. So um, again, just a little bit, it's, it's different. It's the same as what Bruce was explaining, but different as far as the methodology, but really rooted in the behavioral sciences as far as what we consider a behavior. Thank you, Tiffany. So now that concludes our, our slides. We're moving to the panel discussion. I'm going to stop sharing. And I love the introduction because I personally became aware of this practice based on a Kale paper about 10 years ago or something about Bruce and his team working with Lipscomb. There's so many articles, so much talk about the gap between the workplace and the academy. And I saw this practice being done and I thought it was just an amazing breakthrough in really making that connection in an in a incredibly direct way to employers. And so the first question I wanted to explore is from the group, what skill sets do employers want? And given Bruce's background and his work with employers, I wanted to go to Bruce first. Yep, thanks, Nick, and I gave you a little preview earlier, but that you have to begin with the end in mind. And so uh, in my consulting practice, that's one of the first questions, do you, we'd like a, a really good interview program or really good succession management program or who do we recruit for? So um, <clears throat> lots and lots of different approaches, job, job modeling, job analysis, and then in, from learning and development functions, at, you know, training needs analysis, what goals are you gonna set? And then that has all that has evolved in, on the job analysis side into competency modeling. So once again, those processes, when you cross those threads, the, you know, the triangulation, you come up with um, these skill sets. So I've given you the, the general titles, right? Like communication skills, but there are specifics under that, active listening, presentation skills, written skills, communicativeness, um, informal communication skills. And then the problem that there's a, a subset of, of, um, of more cognitive competencies that involve problem solving and good judgment. Um, then the interpersonal skills of relationship building and sensitivity, the emotional intelligence skills. So, so these are um, tried and true um, skill sets that you're gonna find in, uh, um, when people are recruiting, when people are selecting, when people are hiring, when people are promoting that are, um, across industries. Now, it, of course, I'm missing a very important one here, and that is the technical competence, right? So the Society of Human Resources Management has on their website, a thousand different job descriptions. So that would, that would represent being a nurse, a doctor, a pilot, right? A, a mechanical engineer. Those are the, uh, when I went to the Coast Guard Academy, I was taught to be a marine engineer and to drive ships, right? And so in addition to that, one of my passions for being here is that um, over my academic career, I wish there had been more explicit understanding of the competencies, these soft skills that are, that do differentiate performance in organization. So, you know, human resources managers sitting around having lunch often complain that managers hire for the hard skills and fire for the soft skills because the soft skills turn out to be super important, right? How much do you see those varying across employers, Bruce, or not varying? So, you, um, so inflection varies, you know, there's a, a large, uh, so they, 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 they are persistent um, and there is some variance in terms of working at a large manufacturer and seeing a safety competency added, for example. But you'll see that whether I'm working in a large sports and fitness company or a large entertainment company or a large government contractor, and I'm looking at somebody who's competent, I'm gonna find somebody who has good judgment reverse engineer that to good problem solving and decision making skills. Somebody who's persuasive, that's good influence skills or persuasion skills. Somebody who is efficient, that's a good time manager, multitasker, right? Somebody who's able to keep, you know, 12 balls in the air at the same time. And so they are 
pretty persistent. So this, this notion of validity generalization across this subset of competencies um, does stand the test of time and space. Kathy, I know you've done some research or your team and yourself have done some research. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so at Strayer, we were um, originally trying to figure out what were those top skills that employers are looking for that we could incorporate into our general education curriculum. So through that work, we identified what we call 10 essential employability skills. Um, and we, we started that research by identifying them through mapping of frameworks that were out there already that many of you have probably used. So the AAC and U LEAP value rubrics, um, the degree qualifications profile, we did some work with the quality assurance commons on essential employability qualities. So we pulled from there, as well as um, employer requested skills that we could identify through job market data and reports, and then our own employer partners, because um, we have an extensive um, list of employer partners through Strayer. And through all that, we, we, we came up with our set of skills, and then we validated those against the Polaris model from OSI. Um, which uh, we found mapped really well. So, um, you know, it was kind of that convergence, right, of, of everything that Bruce has been just talking about, that, that these skills really are um, uh, something that you see throughout different organizations. They are foundational. And um, that we have found, I think, through our, our work with our students that regardless of what career they're currently in, um, these skills are, are valuable and important to their work. Great to see that alignment when you do that work, isn't it? It was wonderful. <laughs> Tiffany, I know you build programs with employers and universities together. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the way that we would approach uh, building a competency-based program or supporting others to do so, we, we focus on the backward design process because we do um, offer the behavioral assessment as a summative assessment piece to a program, but we do offer the learning journey or the development to uh, uh, lead to successful performance in that behavioral-based assessment and transfer into the workplace role. Um, so when we uh, start with step one of that process, it's really about identifying that competency set. Uh, we often are working with cross-cutting competencies like Bruce and Kathleen are talking about. There are those persistent, we call them cross-cutting competencies, things like problem-solving decision-making, teamwork, communication. But again, oftentimes when we're working with a specific field or industry or workplace role to identify those, we'll define them in a way that contextualizes it. So for example, as part of communication in the field of healthcare, uh, we would often consider person-centered la person language as part of that um, definition and that competency, if that makes sense, because that's what would be expected in that workplace role. And that's what communication, successful performance of communication, that would be one thread that would be expected in the workplace role. But we've worked with, you know, programs like culinary, engineering, general education, um, just a wide variety of different types of programs. And so the process of identifying those competency sets is really about aligning with that workforce, identifying those um, subject matter experts, those key stakeholders, people from workforce boards, the industry, employer partners, getting everyone, faculty, getting everyone at the table to really... Um, talk about what are those essential, those essential knowledge skills required in that workplace role or in that field. So um, again, just to echo what Bruce and Kathleen said, really about uh, partnering with those employers and those industry stakeholders. So that person-centered language anecdote is, is really interesting. How much do you find you need to define a competency for a specific industry or a company? And how do you use that? Do you use that in the measurement? Great question. Yes, we do, actually. So, um, again, we contextualize all of it. So, although you'll see, for example, in communication, right, you're going to observe for things like verbal communication, nonverbal communication, active listening, um, certain strategies or techniques, all of that would be considered cross-cutting, I think, right? So am I leaned forward, making eye contact, nodding my head? Am I asking clarifying questions, paraphrasing? I think Bruce probably very familiar with all of those as that would be similar to his model. So we would be observing for things like that as well. But again, contextualizing all of that. So do I ask the person what they preferred to be called? That's something that would be contextualized or person-centered language. We would be observing for that. That would be a criterion we would be observing and measuring for, for example. Um, 
you know, we'd measure in professionalism and ethics in the field of healthcare, are they maintaining confidentiality? That is a, that would be one significant indicator in that workplace role. So those are the ways that we would contextualize. Um, even though they're cross-cutting, we do contextualize to the field. Uh, and we, yes, we would be observing and measuring for those behaviors as well. Hmm. Great. So Kathy, what, what drove you and your team to try using this model in, in higher ed? What was the fit? Yeah, great question. Um, well, for, first, we're using it for prior learning assessment, and that's how we're utilizing an assessment center. Um, and uh, as you're aware, aware of, Capella um, is one of our affiliate schools, and they recently wrote a white paper around unlocking the full potential of PLA. And in it, they've outlined how um, there's, you know, outcome benefits for students to go through prior learning assessment, especially adult learners, which is our, um, our students or our adult learners at Strayer. Um, and I basically, you know, they were able to find through their research that students who use PLA are more likely to graduate, save money, and complete at a faster rate. And that's something that I think we most, most people who are familiar with PLA have kind of known for some time. And so we've been always trying to think about new and innovative ways that we can help our students um, do those, those the same things, save money and complete at a faster rate. And so Strayers uses the assessment center to provide that way to be able to measure those essential employability skill competencies um, that they can demonstrate through the center. And we know it's a you know, reliable, valid, and effective method to do so. Um, and so our students have the opportunity to earn up to 18 elective credits in our program, and then also gain uh, valuable developmental insights on their workforce skills that they can basically apply right away to their, to their work because they are working adults, most of them. Um, so that was, you know, the, the, the beauty of this model for us was to try to provide that service for our students. Right, and Tiffany, I know you work with multiple universities. What kinds of themes have you seen around their reason to do this practice at their university? I'd say the primary right now is workforce alignment. So I think institutions are seeing the value in leveraging workforce partners and partnering with them to create learning journeys that create a, you know, a create a pipeline into a particular organization, for example, or how can we partner to ensure that graduates are leaving prepared for the workforce with those knowledge and skill sets that they're expecting um, graduates to be able to show you know, performance-wise in the workforce successfully. So I'd say we're seeing workforce alignment as the primary driver. One particular program specifically that uses a PLA model, it started in the workforce. So it was a workforce development program in healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. A particular program worked with then the higher education institutions, college, community colleges and colleges of applied technology and created a master services agreement Meaning in the workforce, if they were to demonstrate the competencies, earn their virtual badge, it, was, um, it became a currency that now the community colleges and colleges of applied technology recognize as college level credit. So they're able to transcribe their workforce training and demonstration for college level credit, um, which opens a career and education pathway uh, for, for that particular um, workforce individual. Are there particular types of institutions or types of programs that are especially likely to take this kind of approach? You know, not necessarily. I would say that um, it's maybe more of a natural fit in workforce solutions or technical education. But when we're partnering with institutions or organizations, it's a wide variety. Four-year institutions, mm -hmm. two-year institutions, technical education, workforce solutions, general education programs, we're seeing a wide range of institutions and organizations pursuing um, workforce alignment. Yeah, that was one of my early takeaways from the original work at Lipscomb was just that this was a really high quality form of assessment. And so it is applicable across, you know, many, if not all instances where behavior-based assessment makes sense which is underused. Uh, Bruce, I know you've also worked with one or more universities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so I, actually the, the light went on for me uh, about 
um, maybe 40 years ago when I discovered Alverno College in Milwaukee, Wisconsin with a little different model. So they had been using, uh, and I had been introduced to the world of assessment centers at, at my current employer, which was a, a, a Fortune 150 company. And in exploring assessment centers, I, this, I discovered Alverno and they were using the process not to like, like you all, to validate competence. So at Lipscomb or at Strayer, we are taking a working professional, giving them an, a day in the life of a professional and then validating their competence and awarding up to 18 units. When you entered Alverno, you came in as a 17 or 18 year old and they measured you and you went through like four assessment centers across these competencies, problem solving, decision-making, interpersonal, you know, once again, uh, to Kathleen's point, cross-validation, great minds think alike. <laughs> rediscovered again that these eight, six or eight competency areas. And so that's a different model. We've also worked um, with um, uh, using the competencies for strictly development at Portland State University in their executive MBA program. We used a different technique, a multi-rated survey called the 360. So every EMBA would um, go through, these are working adults who have access to folks who can give them ratings, right? And so in addition to becoming a captain of industry by learning finance, marketing, strategy, sales, or whatever, there was a parallel track in which they were you, a coach, coached them in opportunities for development. And across the curricula, a, a faculty was assigned a competency to reinforce, right? So in finance, I did presentation skills. And so I gave you feedback, not just on your acquisition of income statement balance sheet, ROIC, but also on your communication skills, right? And in the program I teach at UCSD here, it's a similar program where we use a competency set as a development set, right? So you, you we teach content, because um, this is a college extended study certificate program. We teach the content you'll know need to know in terms of law and finance and so forth, but we also put you into a, a, a developmental program that involves a diagnostic upfront, in this case, a 360, and then a continuing development process across the year where you're with us. And then we test you in a simulation at the, at the end to see uh, acquisition of the of required proficiency, so. That's great. And I know Alverno College is one of the really early competency-based education kind of pioneers. In the Indeed. Um, Callie Morrison asked the question about are you working with Open Skills Network or any other organizations like Credential Engine? I'll answer that for myself. I have been participating in the OSN and they just um, launched the Open Skills Management tool really recently. Um, and I have published courses out to Credential Engine. I haven't been involved in connecting this assessment center work to either of those organizations yet, um, though I could see that happening in the future. Does anybody else have any comments on, on those organizations? Any engagement with them? The Competency-Based Education Network has others involved in that work. I'm aware of it. I'm not heavily involved in it myself. But, for example, Dr. Sharla Long, she stays very up-to-date on, you know, the Open Skills Network, Credential Engine, and all of the work being done um, in areas like that. So CBEN itself does. I'm just not specifically familiar with it. Sure. So assessment centers have historically been done face-to-face, -face, and I believe all of you have done them face-to-face, -face, but given COVID, we have all experienced doing them remotely. So I'd like to hear and have the group hear about how you made the decision to go online or virtual, um, and when you did that, how you did that. And let's start with Tiffany. Yep, absolutely. Um... Really, it's going to depend on the institution for CBEN. So when we're working across institutions, um, it's really uh, what is best for their learner population? What are they used to? How can they provide accessibility? Um, again, the, from the TQI hat or the Quilts Institute hat with our healthcare program, uh, we immediately went virtual. Um, that was not the initial plan. But then when we did implement, it's what made the most sense. So we started talking about a statewide rollout um, and providing assessments and accessibility for learners across the state. So even thinking, you know, very rural areas of Tennessee, for example, how will learners get to a, a physical location? 
Do we create a mobile assessment option? You know, there were a lot of things put on the table. And then we were introduced to, to some technologies. And so, for example, in that particular program, they use immersion technology, where they use um, avatars powered by humans. So it's, it's an assessment that occurs in real time, um, standardized, all of that. But for example, just researching the technologies that could be leveraged, it was possible for us to go virtual. And therefore, it made the programs um, accessible to many more learners than it otherwise would have. And so that was really what pushed us, I guess, was the accessibility piece. And then another piece was really the cost effectiveness. So again, setting up physical centers, having people perhaps be in standardized role play situations or, you know, um, standardized patient type experiences like you would find in a medical field. The cost was really a, a big consideration. And so when we were able to leverage a technology such as Mersion, um, it really opened the door to providing and serving a lot more learners um, than we anticipated. Right. And Kathy, how did you make that decision? Yeah, it's a good question. So Strayer's already, already has um, a, a very large presence online. All of our undergraduate and graduate programs are fully online. Um, but we also have a very large footprint. We have 65 campuses where students can get um, support services and take select classes. And so when we first began, we began with the assessment centers face-to-face -face in two of our campuses, um, really to kind of test the model. And we decided to take the center virtually for two reasons. Um, as Tiffany said, accessibility was a big one. Um, and then of course the operational impacts of COVID-19. So given the fact that most of our students attend online um, and not all were close to a campus, we really wanted to make sure that we could bring this, bring this up to, to make it available to all of our students. Um, but then in early 2020, we had to temporarily close our campuses due to COVID-19. So we took the opportunity at that point to start researching and planning how can we transition this you know, assessment center to a virtual modality. And we began having lots of fun conversations with Bruce to figure out how we were going to get there. Bruce, running an institution, but similar question to you. Yeah, so that's so in my experience, say you know, ninety nine percent of centers have been run live, live, right? And that that um, so this was a challenge two years ago to think about this in a in a virtual format. So as as Kathleen and Tiffany have alluded to, we did lots and lots of head scratching and thinking about how to how we would emulate the live experience. And of course, some of it actually turned out to be, you know, um, both face and relatively easy, face valid and relatively easy to do. If you're using assessment center as a staple of them as a leaderless group discussion in which you've got typically six participants and an ambiguous task for them in a standardized experience, they have to solve a problem together. And Zoom, and we're all on Zoom, really lends itself to that. In fact, it's easier in some ways to assess them, right? And similar with role plays or with interviews, right? The uh, multitasking in-basket exercise proved a challenge. How much did you need to emulate an actual um, digital experience for the participant versus the physical experience? And so we worked on a number of different options and, and then have cracked the code on that in the last few months to allow us, you know, from a, my design point of view, we have to see enough behavior to reliably rate it, right? This is an independent exercise. And so presenting that paper and pencil online now, um, and we've, we have amended some of the ways we administer it, allowing for a little more time for a little thicker administration for uh, the digital administration, but then retaining, looking back and retaining the amount of behavior and standards that we, we need to reliably rate a, a competency like problem solving or organizing and planning. So, um, you know, and, and of course, you know, from a scalability and accessibility point of view, it, it, you know, it opens up, you know, wide horizons. So I know from when we talked about this before that when you're faced with planning how to do this remotely, you had a team on it and served in kind of a consulting capacity. Can you say any more about how you worked with institutions on planning these assessment centers? as remote experiences? Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of the guardian of the professional standards to make sure that we don't, you know, so a concern would be that we, that, you know, that the, uh, that the remote experience compromises somewhat the live experience. And so uh, how would you do that? And then, you know, and how would, would there be 
differences in, um, in administration. So monitoring that. So we did, we did lots of conversations and, lot, and we did many pilots to perfect it, right? So that we were, uh, we, we tried it out to see if it, it would work and then made adjustments to both administration, minor adjustments to the content to, to perfect it, to make sure that we still could look across a set. Assessment centers demand at least three raters that are trained and they operate in a parallel universe as they're watching and observing and uh, to, to main ob maintain objectivity. So you can watch, for example, uh, um, rating ranges and see if they collapse around the three point honor scale and see whether or not they're actually able to discern and differentiate behavior. So that's a great little red flag about whether or not your exercise is providing, a, a, you know, a, a, a diverse behavior. So enough to chew on to make a rating. So, you know, once again, um, uh, helping with the competencies, but then helping with um, the standard methods for assessment centers and and some of it, some of it in terms of uh, the meeting technology and role plays, interviews, um, and you know, instantly uh, transferable. Um, some of some a little harder. Some of the integration processes are really much easier now online. To tell you the truth, right? So, sure. hmm. how about you, Kathy? How did you approach planning these remote assessment centers? Well, um, in addition to leaning on Bruce, <laughs> we um, we really were trying to research like what are the different approaches, and um, you know we we Bruce talked about the in in basket exercises. We did actually think should we have some sort of a, a technology that can do that, and so we did look to see what's out there and if sort of is there something out of the box? Do we have something customized? Um, and we evaluated those against different set of criteria. Um, but I'd say that the most important criteria that we had were, you know, the ability to measure those competency behaviors, right? We, exactly what Bruce just said. Can we do this in a virtual format? Um, the technology experience. We didn't want, we didn't want to um, have throw too much technology at our students either, right? Something that would make sense, something that, um, you know, is is seamless and something that they would normally use in a workforce setting would also be beneficial. And then the inclusion of personalized feedback. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we did, that the heart of this, in for us anyways, for their students, is the feedback session that they get at the end of this. That's what makes the difference for our students. It's not even just about did they earn credit. While that's important for them for the PLA reasons, um, most of the times our students are, are really focused on the impactful type of feedback they get and how helpful that is for them. So we did wanted to make sure that whatever we did virtually, that those were the three things that we could maintain. Great, and Tiffany, how did you work on planning these sessions? Um, so really when we were planning these sessions, it was really about standardizing those assessment um, scenarios. So how we approach I guess the, the process of virtual assessment is that we start by recruiting authentic workforce scenarios. So we work with employer partners, subject matter experts, we recruit those authentic uh, workplace situations, and then we work uh, to create what we call a delivery template to standardize each of those scenarios, and so they're offered an equally um, weighted experience across learners. Uh, so we had to do that, right, to um, in order to uh, determine how we were going to measure those competencies and what types of scenarios those competencies could be measured um, in a valid and reliable way, like Bruce and Kathleen have been, been speaking to. So we do use scenarios that we measure or isolate the competencies, although one situation can measure multiple competency areas. We do measure them in isolation. And I see Bruce uh, shaking his head. So for example, if one partic particular situation measures four competency areas, for example, communication, person-centered practices, evaluation and observation, professionalism and ethics. A learner can be proficient in communication, but perhaps need development in professionalism and ethics, um, if that makes sense. So they're all measured in isolation, even though it's, um, they're able to behave or perform in one singular um, simulation exercise. So um, those were all built. Um, that's really how we prepared after we identified the technology, um, ran a pilot. So what was very important to our process was running a pilot, ensuring that we had those indicators, you know, accurate. They were valid to the workplace. Um, it was a, I always say, we love to hear when a learner uh, goes through the assessment exercise, we'll hear things like, I felt like I was at work. 
Um, and that's what you want to hear, right? You're like, okay, we got it right. Um, are you measuring what you're intending to measure? So in planning for it, I guess a lot of what Bruce and Kathleen were saying, ensuring we were still measuring what we were intending to measure so that when we were validating that those knowledge and skill sets, it was accurate and that it did indicate likelihood of success in the workplace role. So I think just intentionally and strategically approaching um, that when you go virtual is very important. When you were doing that measurement in an online environment, did you have any challenges with nonverbal communication and capturing that or your assessors capturing that? We did not have that as a, as a barrier. Um, so we do require though, uh, and, and our learners are made very well aware of this, which I think comes later. How do you prepare your learners for expectations, right? Um, they are required to have certain technological um, requirements to participate. So they do have to have video. They do have to have audio so that we can record that behavioral data, both verbal and nonverbal. Again, even though we contextualize the competencies, they are still considered cross-cutting. So we are looking for things like nonverbal communication. Um, and we were able to capture that. And honestly, in today's world, most meetings are happening in a virtual space, right? And so uh, measuring those nonverbal behaviors, for example, just like you would typically or like we see each other every day um, became important. But yes, our learners are required to have both audio and video. Right, and to the group here with us, feel free to add any questions you may have for our panelists to the chat. We have about 20 minutes left or a little more than 15 minutes left, it looks like. Let me, let me add just an enhancement to, from live centers to the virtual centers, and that is the because we're doing it on Zoom, we're able to audio and video record it. So that's hard to do in person. So our our assessors are able to go back and review, right? So, mm. you know, getting a big screen like you know, I have a big monitor, right? And looking at the, the Hollywood squares is easy, you know, then in terms of your question about nonverbals being, you know, 60% of the message, easy to see them, rate them, right? But then it's also, this is provided a much easier way to re review for assessors afterwards. So the technology has been an enhancement in that way. So, it makes sense. Several of you have pointed out that work looks more like what we're doing right now these days, uh, Hollywood Squares, than it does the water cooler. Um, but students coming to universities probably still picture classes in which they're sitting in rows in front of a professor. And so it must be a little bit challenging to talk to them or to invite them to engage in this kind of experience. So I'm really curious how you're sharing with students what to expect with an assessment center. And I'll, I'll direct that question to Kathy first. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, our students are, like I said, primarily online and they're, it's asynchronous. So they don't, they don't normally have Zoom sessions with anybody um, in the same way that what we're doing now. So each of our students, first they go through a one-to-one -one conversation with our director for prior learning assessment um, to make sure they understand the expectations of the center. You know, it is a, a full day and they're on, they can't be multitasking <laughs> when they're in the middle of doing this. Um, so he yeah, makes sure that, that they understand that. Um, and it's a delicate balance for us between understanding those expectations without giving too much information away. So we don't want the participants, we want the participants to be themselves when they're going through this experience and authentic. Um, so we don't provide them too many details on the specific activities. We don't want them kind of doing too much pre-prep, so to speak. Um, but at the end of the assessment center, we do kind of peel back the curtain and they learn all about it. Um, but then we also provide a pre-assessment walkthrough of using the technology. So again, our director for PLA will, um, will spend time, with, again, these assessment centers are small, there's six students in one session, so they're able to spend time with each of the students ahead of time to make sure that they're comfortable with the technology, they know what they're going to need to do, um, that they know how to not just do computer audio, that they're prepared to call in if there's an audio issue or if there's... Um, a problem with them connecting on their PC, that they've got a phone ready or something so that they can they can be able to manage those sorts of technology issues that might come up, which we've not had any really. So that's been thankful. 
That's great. Did you say the participants go the entire day without checking their email? Well, we hope. <laughs> right? um, they are on video the whole time. Um, really? You know, yeah, as, as, as a, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that it's them doing the work, right? <laughs> so they're mm -hmm. on video, um, you know, and they certainly could, I suppose, be trying to check email, but they're usually pretty attentive to what's going on. It's, it's an intensive day. Uh, it's an exhausting day for them. Um, so we do make sure that they are aware of that before they get in, into it. We, we do give them a lunch break. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. they do get lunch break and a couple of breaks, so that's why you know during those times they could they could check their email if they'd like to. I well, wouldn't advise it. <laughs> okay. How about you, Tiffany? How do you prepare students for the experience? Yeah, something we always recommend, uh, no matter what type of institutional organization we're working with, is an orientation. Um, of some kind. And so for us, oftentimes that's a virtual orientation, an orientation module, so to speak. So they'll go through, they experience all the different assessment types that they'll encounter in their learning journey. Um, they're introduced to the simulation software, that type of assessment, what they can expect. We even had a, um, I think an animation video made about it. So they learn more about it. Just like Kathleen said, we don't give them the specific exercise, but we tell them what to expect as far as technology required, they're going to be engaging with avatars. They're going to encounter a workforce situation. Um, so we try to set them up for success in that way. And so they don't just go into this environment, right? And all of a sudden there's an avatar and they're put in this situation. But I will say oftentimes learners have not experienced something like that, um, even though you prepare them. And so you do often still hear the, whoa, you know, <laughs> that was that was intense or that was, you know, that was real. You know, you'll just hear those kind of expressions in a, I think sometimes a surprising way or a positive way is really how we hear those. Um, we also have, when the learners go into a simulation exercise, they're welcomed by a host avatar. Again, that's human powered, it's happening in real time. So that person can help them um, really uh, work through any technology uh, challenges they might be having. So if their audio isn't working or their video isn't working, that person is actually live there, right there with them, and they can talk them through getting their video turned on, for example. Um, they do also receive in their learning journey. So again, our learners go through a learning journey first, and then they go into the assessment exercise, even though it's a PLA that goes into higher ed, because again, we're in the workforce. Um, they do receive pre-assessment materials. Again, we're like, congratulations, you made it to this point, you're about to go, you know, into an assessment experience, worded much more nicely than that, but um, they meet, again, the avatar, the specific avatar that they'll be working with, given some context or framing to go into the simulation. So they, they do receive material on the front end um, to welcome them into that experience and, and help them determine what to expect. So you give them Perfect. practice tips, but they're still surprised by what the experience is. They probably can't quite imagine how it's going to work, right? I think we see that they're most surprised at how real it is, how, how much real. they feel, how engaged they get, how um, with the virtual simulations, they refer to it as suspension of disbelief, where that habit of behavior just comes out, right? They just begin behaving like they would in the workplace. And I think that's mostly the surprise we see about how quote, real to life it felt or it was. That's really the reactions that we get. That's cool. And Bruce, how about you? What have you seen in terms of setting expectations and what works or doesn't work? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think you and I were talking last week about, you know, I can know that I'm, I'm trying out for the golf team and I can know that I'm going to have to drive and hit on the fairway and maybe hit out of a bunker and have approach shots and putt. And so I can know all that. I still have to perform, right? So people, so I'm, I'm a little more relaxed about not disclosing things to people. I've been in companies that have had 30 years of assessment center experience, sales, marketing. So, and so pretty much people know not the content because we keep that dear and secret because the exercises like in baskets and, and role plays all have specific content. But knowing I can Google what assessment center might be like, I'm going to have a role play. I'm going to have a multitasking exercise. I have confidence even if you reveal that. The best advice is still get a good night's sleep, have a good breakfast, <laughs> put a smile on your face and a song in your heart, and then be yourself, but stretch yourself. And then I always add, like in companies where we've had 30 years of experience, somebody might whisper in your ear, 
that you should delegate in the in basket, right? And so that's really important. And then unfortunately they obsess around one thing and they abdicate or over rev. So step back, do, do your best, be yourself, right? So that, that kind of general prep for, you know, that's like getting ready for work in the morning, get a good breakfast, get a good night's sleep. <laughs> so, and, and then go in and, and give us your best. All right, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how it was conducted, but I feel like we've already shared a lot of the details of how these centers were conducted. So I'd like to jump to what results you've seen um, and conclusions. And let me start with you, Bruce, on virtual versus face-to-face. -face. What have you seen in terms of the differences or commonalities? So I think, um, you know, we've been very pleased with our ability to differentiate a, a dozen different competencies, right? And so, and provide uh, high inter-rater reliability and a credible, valid um, um, experience that, that awards credit. And we have confidence that we were able to measure these competencies in, and, and provide. And just as a sidebar, I was involved in some of the pilots and it's incredibly gratifying to take somebody who's been, you know, retooling themselves at age 35 and they get 18 units of credit from one day of experience because, and it validates, you know, they did learn problem solving and decision making at the world's largest retailer. They were, you know, they do have influence skills. And so, um, and that, and then it, uh, it, it was really um, gratifying to be able to do that. So um, I do, you know, there's a part of me that still thinks that the live experience will have a slight you know, I call it, you know, disturbing impact on your personality. I've been through three assessment centers. And the first one I went through a number of years ago, I was a young manager in a corporation after leaving the Coast Guard. Still the most, most impactful developmental experience of the dozens and dozens I've had over the years. And I think part of that is the live center. So um, not to say that, you know, we're getting feedback from the Strayer Center that, you know, just like Tiffany said, <laughs> this is a really engaging, energetic, wow, the day went by like that. And yeah, the in-basket was realistic, just like a day at work, yikes, right? So um, it still has an emotional impact. So, but in, you know, we, you know, you know, we human beings do, are we are social animals. And so I think that the, uh, the idea of, of um, the live part will add a little more emotional impact Oh, that makes sense. And I do hear about that emotional impact being perhaps the biggest part for a lot of participants. Kathy, what have you seen in the comparing the face-to-face -face ones at campuses and the virtual ones this year? Yeah, you know, I, as Bruce was saying, I, seeing them both, I'm, I actually think they're both equally, <laughs> equally powerful for our students. Um, that that's been the, the experience up to this point. But um, but one thing I wanted to comment on with that is that because our students don't get a lot of time to see each other, right? They're on, you know, discussion forums and so forth. They're not, they're not meeting face to face typically. Um, this provides that it, it's a different, you know, something where these these this small group of six students can come together and experience something that they don't experience in the rest of their of their program. So I think there's some value to that for us as well. But um, we, you know, our results really was that we, we were able to measure the behaviors, right, which is one of those main things we set out to do. Um, our participants have been performing on par with those that, that we saw in the face-to-face -face setting. Um, the technology worked. We, we were, again, nervous about that at first because we've all had problems on Zoom and things happen and um, we haven't had any major issues. And maybe part of that is helping with the training ahead of time, right, making sure everybody's prepared. Um, we, use, um, we use Box. You know, instead of like Google and those sorts of things uh, as a cloud documents storage service because it had a few extra uh, tools for me to lock down Bruce's IP for him. <laughs> so we, we've been using Box as our, uh, as our um, tool for students and they've, they also get us some training on how that works and that's gone you know, pretty seamless, which I was also pleased about. Um, so you know, the, the technology worked well and then finally again, that personal, personalized feedback, we were able to do that and still provide that, that for our students. So um, 
you know, we're, we're pretty pleased with where we're at. Long term, we will be following our participants um, to see how they do from a sex metrics perspective, if I can say that, such as like persistence, time to completion, those sorts of things. Um, so we will be following them through their journey and their programs to see if this is as, as beneficial as what we are hoping. Sure. And Tiffany, lastly, over to you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, again, this just depends on the program we're working with, um, but we've seen everywhere from, you know, counselors who are being trained to work with um, individuals with addictions, for example. And so things like that makes sense that they would happen in person, those types of assessments, because in the workplace, that's often happening in person. It happens a lot more virtually now, I'd say, in today's world than it used to. Um, but again, I think we really just try to mirror what's the real-to-life context of that particular workplace role. And that's where I think you really determine whether um, virtual makes sense or real, you know, in-person makes sense, trying to match that or mirror that workplace role as closely as possible. And sometimes a mix, just like work, right? Sometimes we all go into the office twice a week, and sometimes we're in virtual three times a week. So um, as far as outcomes, I don't know that I, I mean, I've not seen a significant difference in being able to, again, measure and validate competency sets, uh, whether it was virtual or um, in person. But I think that goes back to that planning question. Are you appropriately matching, right, the technology or the assessment methodology or type to the competencies and behaviors tr you're trying to measure. We actually do not um, use virtual technology right now to measure any kind of technical skills. So for example, in nursing, we're not using um, technology to measure those types of skills. The institution may be, but we're not. We focus on those cross-cutting. So again, when you answer, or when you ask that question about like having the camera and you're able to get those nonverbal behaviors, we're focusing on those cross-cutting might be very different for like technical skills, drawing blood or something like that. Um, and so as far as metrics, you know, we like our healthcare program, for example, we look at things like performance in the workplace. Um, is it leading to performance in the workplace? In that one particular healthcare program and that, that workplace role, the attrition rate is higher than the national average or has been. So we're tracking long term, right? Is turnover decreasing? Are people persisting in the field? Are they starting to... Um, you know, uh, view this role as a career. So again, trying to really open up that career and education pathway. Are they transcribing their training for workforce or for college level credit? Um, what does the satisfaction and quality of care look like? Are, you know, consumers um, happy? So there's a lot of metrics that really uh, are being tracked. But again, that's every year it's reviewed. It was, we collected a lot of data on the front end. This was implemented and we continue to collect data and review it quarterly. So um, a lot of metrics being followed. There are a lot of interesting and unique metrics. Um, thanks for sharing that. We're, we're just about at the end of our time. So I want to pause to see if there are any more questions from the group here. We have two minutes left. So if you have any questions, even if you're on the fence about asking a question, now's the time. I'll pause just for a moment to see if anybody adds any questions to the chat. Okay, I'm not seeing anything come through. So I'd like to thank each of you, Tiffany, Kathy, Bruce, for sharing all of this really fascinating work. I think it's really groundbreaking work. I really would love to see this expand and become just general practice. So thank you so much for all of your work in the space and for sharing it with this group today. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Nick. Thank Thanks, you, Nick, for, for doing this. So as we close out our session, I just wanna thank everyone for attending and thank you very much to our presenters and for Nick for moderating. We recorded this session and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us now for a fun networking social to close out the day. Thank you all and please remember if you have the opportunity to fill out the survey, we would really appreciate taking the time to do that. So have a nice evening, everyone. Have a good day, bye-bye.